How's it going, everybody? It's me, She Says, from Boundary Break, and you're watching a Cuphead episode. Now, if you've never seen Boundary Break before, it's a show where we basically take the camera anywhere we want, and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. Now, before we get on to that, there are people behind the scenes making these episodes possible. This week, the camera was made by Ataraxia. They do some really cool stuff on Twitter. Some of the things that I really appreciate is that they show you what is getting rendered in at what times before a level or a frame gets loaded in. And if you're interested in that or the YouTube channel, you know, just check out the video video description down below. You can get a look of what I'm talking about. And I want to just give a quick shout out to Kane Zatenzukin. This is who I believe was the first person to ever make a Cuphead camera. Unfortunately, there was compatibility issues and that's where Ataraxia comes in. But I still tip my hat to you, sir. But anyways, with all that said, I just want to show you guys some really cool stuff that I managed to find out of bounds in Cuphead. Let's get started. Now, there is a lot to be said about the production of this game and we're going to cover that. But first, I want to start with the basics. In the tutorial here, you can see there's a point in which you're supposed to be able to practice reviving another character. Taking the camera underneath the stage can show you that there is a second Cuphead that seems to die endlessly to be able to produce that ghost. Slowing down the footage here can show you a couple frames of animation while Cuphead is still alive. Now you've already might have noticed that in some scenes that you've seen in this episode there is no film grain. Well, I know that feels like heresy to a lot of Cuphead fans, I get it, but for this episode there's going to be a lot of zoom outs and so for clarity's sake we found a way to remove that filter. It just makes the detail that much more crisp when you zoom it out. Like for example, this running gun section. If it was with film grain, it would just be that much harder to see the outlines of all the small characters that are now at this point very far away. But I wanted to go back to that starting area. Now, it's not gonna be animated here. This is because these are rendered frames. But here's what the scene looks like with the top layer that kind of covers over the well-detailed background. And here's what it looks like without. By the way, this just happened mid-production. Something very incredible has just taken place. I reached out to the guys at Studio MDA HR to see if they'd be able to answer a couple of questions just to kind of add some accuracy to the episode. And Tina, who was one of the 2D animators on the team, reached out, which I'm very thankful for. So what happened was I asked a bunch of questions and then various members from the team started answering them, which is something I've never seen before. So thank you guys at Studio MDHR, all of you. And I'll make sure that all of your Twitter handles are shown on the screen as we talk about some of the stuff that you guys explained. So again, thanks a lot. And with that said, one of the questions I had was I was wondering if these backgrounds were done completely physically or if there was some digital touch-ups. I know there's some information here and there that kind of shows that there was some physicality involved, but I just wanted to be sure. And so the person responsible for all these backgrounds, Caitlin Russell, responded herself by saying the backgrounds are completely painted in watercolor and then scanned. And so by that account, some of these brush strokes that you see here outside the boundaries are real watercolor brush strokes. That isn't to say that some stuff wasn't done digitally. The frame-by-frame -frame animations starts off with real life sketches as shown here but then afterwards it's scanned into the computer and the coloring is done digitally on photoshop and so with all that in mind i want to show you guys grim matchstick he's featured in this behind the scenes video and you can see how he starts off with his tail in the sketching process and then he loses most of it later on as the artists start to understand that most of his tail is not going to be shown in the actual game and so to save just a little bit of time you'll see that the nub on his tail just goes all over the place now the reason why it goes all over the place and you're going to see lots of examples as this as we go through the episode is that the consistency only matters for what's on screen. What's off screen here is just a rounded point so that the artist can use a fill tool and just do one easy click to make the entire portion that the artist wanted that one color. But like I said the nub remains just to make the process a little bit faster for the artist. Now let's talk about some of the things that were hidden by layers. We got Captain Briny Beard here. Now, I figured that this was all just one giant drawing, but I was mistaken by that. This footage proves that he's on a separate layer from the boat. And by removing the boat, you can see that he has two peg legs, something that is completely obscured at all times. Here's something that's kind of weird about the shark. So you can see that there's the shark fin that goes off into the background at first, and then the shark shows up on the dock. Now, for whatever reason, at a certain point, the shark fin attaches itself to the shark, giving him two fins technically, but the background element fin seems to travel with the separate shark model as he finally leaves the screen. And what's really cool is that for one of the transformation scenes for the boat, they accidentally left in a lot of information about the animation cells. In the far right hand corner, you can see various words like whale boat 16, BWI 5, BWI 7, BWI 11, 15, 17, 22, and then it says here whale boat 8, 
ACL jaw fix, two out of three. Now, what does this acronym stand for? What does this number mean? To answer that, we had to go and ask the team. And with Tina being one of the animators, of course, she was up first, and it turned out she was not the person who animated that scene. So she passed the question off to Jake Clark, who's also a lead animator on Cuphead. Jake then said that he was also not responsible for this, so he threw his guess at either Chad or Smomotion. Now, it's looking like it was Chad who animated the scene. We can't know for sure, but we now know that Smomotion was also not the person who edited this particular part of the game. However, since I wasn't able to get a hold of Chad, we got a general explanation from Smomotion. And to quote what he said here on Twitter, he said, to my eye, that looks like a frame number, not an animation chart specifically. The letters would likely be the animator designated to the specific action to keep their paper straight. Looks like they even wrote in the second frame, Boat Whale Idol, BWI, then the frame number. So BWI stands for Boat Whale Idol, most likely, and the numbers that are penned here look like they're the sequential order of each frame. Anyways, here's a run and gun stage here, and zooming out the camera just even a little bit can show you the canvas that these backdrops are made from. You can even see where the strokes end. It's really cool. But moving a little bit further ahead, you can see woodpeckers that are supposed to attack Cuphead. And moving the camera up can show you that it's just a neck. It's not much more than that, which you're going to find a lot of in Cuphead. The team here really knew what they were doing when they decided to work in certain characters and enemies that just have parts of them show up in the stage. And much, much further ahead at the top of the tree, you have these characters that hold up little leaves for you. And if you stand on them, they get shot by something and then they fall down. Taking the camera all the way out, and I know that it's a little bit hard for you guys to see what's going on here, you can see that the enemy drops all the way down here, and then it deliberately travels all the way back up. And what's even more fascinating is that it turns out that if we were to drop down there with them, there is an invisible surface that these characters land on, which I have to imagine serves as a trigger for them to eventually go back up and become platforms again. Now I want to talk about a few weird things that I managed to find out of bounds. In the mausoleums, you have these ghosts here that are trying to get to the urn, and they come from all sides of the walls. Now, when you pan the camera out, there's a drawing from each part where the ghosts seem to come from. And this is a bit unusual. You don't really see this in Cuphead, so I had to reach out once again, because I just wanted to know if this unique drawing was meant to be seen by the player at one point. And programmer Kazia Adamo, and I hope to God I am pronouncing that right, and she said there's sprites from some other boss that were meant to indicate spawn points for the ghosts. And by doing it like this, it allowed the designers to move it around in Unity in any way that they wanted to. Also got to ask her why exactly there are some forms of the bosses stored out of bounds. You see it all over Cuphead. Here's a couple examples right here. And although it's not done in every single instance, it's done in a lot. And she said, and I quote, basically, this just makes them easier to switch in or out on the fly. It's better for memory management to have the game objects instantiated at the beginning of the scene, which is really, really cool. And here's a couple of things that are outside the boundaries as well. Now, None of what I really found here was completely unused. Like for example, here's a watercolor painting of a seaport, but this looks like a duplicate of one that you can see earlier in the stage over by the crabs here. Another thing that was also out of the bounds is this platform over on the right here. It's in the upper right hand corner, and it looks like it's a propeller platform, and it's never used. That is to say that this platform is never used. The family of platforms that this belongs to is used later on in the stage. But while we're here, let's also talk about this ridiculousness going on with the descent down the mountain. Now you may have already noticed something a little bit strange going on. So let's rewind it back and show you in game what's going on. So you start at the top of this mountain here and then there's this platform that slides down the mountain and it all looks very organic and you reach the bottom and then you're just on your way. But in truth, if you zoom the camera out, you can see that the platform nor the stages are really going anywhere at all. It's all an illusion. The backdrops and the roads creates an animation that makes it look like you're descending, but you're just suspended in place until the game finally decides to push this piece of environment down below here a little bit upwards so that it can make the connection. Now let's talk more about layers. It should be stated that Ataraxia donated a lot of this footage here, so I'm just going to give all credit to them. And again, links to their stuff in the video description down below. So first off, Cuphead is very charming. I think that goes without saying, but part of that charm is that in some scenes, there are characters that are just spying on you from another side of a wall, which involves layers. First one that I can think of is this troll that eventually chases after you. He's just mean mugging you through this hole in the wall. And as you start 
start going through the platforms, he starts chasing after you. And by the way, here's a zoom out of his entire body. And it's pretty funny because he has a perfect circle going on down there. Now, I was just about to give all credit towards Ataraxia, but let's be honest here. This is some hodgepodge stuff that I wasn't able to get good footage for. So I'm just going to take the fault for this one. We have our editor, Mike, kind of zoom in all the way at the bottom of this footage here. You can see that it's just the head of the troll. There's no shoulders or anything quite like that. The animators went for the trouble of making a separate head model just for that one little scene. But then they did something similar with the cat as well. At a certain point, you can see the cat looking through another hole in the wall, but removing the layer that covers up this little scene, you can see that it's just the head of the cat. But the head of the cat is completely drawn. Also, just for fun, we can show how the rest of the scene is rendered in here. And it even reveals that there are layers to boss characters as well, with things like the inside of the can coming in first, then with the contraption going over that, with the plank of wood holding it up, and with the wheels being added last. I'll show you one more. We got Dr. Call's robot, and we're gonna show you what the whole scene looks like as it's getting rendered in. First you start with the sunset background, then you start to add in the skyline, then you start to add in the city buildings. Three layers of them, in fact. Then we got the clouds, then the fence, then the garbage, the machinery for the garbage, more garbage, and now we're actually getting into the action here. And with the robot, it starts with the base, and then it adds a hand, then the torso, then some color for the vent, then some color for the shutter on his stomach, and then it looks like the opening for the shutter is overlaid over the shutter itself. Then the head is added, then the arm, then the closed piece on his chest, and lastly, the little zappy do on his head. All right, let's start doing some zoom outs of the hub environment. Now, there are three sections to Cuphead, and it would appear that the entire map of Cuphead is not loaded all at once. I imagine it eats up a lot of memory to have all the things there all at once, but it is interesting to note that when you load a section of the map, all the characters and all the animations that go with this scene are all loaded at once. Nothing is called out to save on resources here. So here's a good zoom out of the first map. And here's a good zoom out of the second map, but here's something really cool about the second map. There's a little bit left over of the third map that's out of bounds. And if you look at the spots where there should be buildings animated for the third map, you can see that the artist left white canvases for the animators to put in place. And again, it's great because you can see the sketchy lines and watermarks and brush strokes that bleed into the white part of the canvas. And lastly, here's a zoom out of the third area. Thank you so much to Mana, Steven Olsen, and the Unknown Gamer for being incredibly generous with donations to help support the show. It's difficult times for ad revenue, folks. If you want to help, it's a good time to do it. Patreon link is in the video description down below. Thank you so much to the team from Cuphead, as well as Ataraxia. Take care.